Mean Old Lion Media presents Corner Table Talk. So welcome everyone to Corner Table Talk. I'm your host, Brad Johnson. Here we explore subjects related to food plus drink plus culture. As always, we welcome your questions and comments. You can always reach me at brad at postandbeamhospitality.com. So we may cover a little food plus drink, but today's show is heavy on culture. People who have had a hand in shaping many significant cultural moments in entertainment are often not in front of the camera and or microphone sometimes times here behind the scenes and the hand the public does not always get a chance to see. While the names may be familiar, certainly well known within the industry, the general public may only say that name sounds familiar. That may be the case with my guest today, though if you were a fan of the Jackson 5 as I was as a kid, you might recall first hearing about her in 1970 when Michael Jackson and his talented brothers burst on the scene. Her resume is long, and she has stacked up so many awards we could do an entire podcast about the various accolades. But some of the highlights include two Emmys, a Golden Globe, five NAACP Image Awards, three Peabody Awards, the Revlon Businesswoman of the Year Award, the Whitney M. Young Award, the George Arendt Award, which is the highest alumni honor presented by Syracuse University, which is her alma mater, two Harvard Business School case studies, and doctorate of humane letters from Howard University, Essence Hollywood Women of Power Visionary Award, Black Enterprise Power Brokers. She's been inducted into the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame and the Women in Film Crystal Award. For outstanding women who, through their endurance and the excellence of their work, have helped to expand the role of women within the entertainment industry. Pretty big deal. The Jackie Robinson Trailblazer Award, the Madam C.J. Walker Award. I said this could go on. She's also been nominated for an Academy Award for co-writing the screenplay for Diana Ross and Billy D. Williams' classic Lady Sings the Blues. She worked alongside Motown founder Barry Gordy, eventually became president of Motown Productions, the television and film arm of the company. And she produced the Motown 25th anniversary special, which drew close to 34 million viewers when it aired on NBC in 1983. The highlight was Michael Jackson tossing his hat into the audience and doing the moonwalk to Billie Jean, a moment that is cemented in American music history. If all of that hasn't given it away, I'm honored to have as my guest today, the illustrious and always elegant (laughs) co-chair of the past Jones Entertainment and her business partner, Madison Jones. My guest today is Suzanne DePass. Suzanne, thank you for being on the show. I got tired listening to you. (laughs) 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 Amazing. That's your life. 50 years. (laughs) (laughs) So, Suzanne, it's so nice to have you. Um, I kick things off with what I call short order questions. So I'm just going to fire a few of these at you and, and get your quick take, if you will. So what are you listening to? or reading these days. Tell me, is is there any music that's on uh, heavy rotation uh, on your playlist or anything interesting that you're reading? Well, you know, it's so interesting when you talk about music. I feel like I have overdosed on music in my life. (laughs) And um, I'm tending to listen to people like Ed Sheeran and others who are more calming in my life than reliving those thrilling days of yesteryear. But every now and then I will put on, you know, some Motown music and uh, try not to break out in hives due to the memories (laughs) 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 involved in making those, those records. But um, my, my musical tastes have always been very eclectic growing up in New York. So it just depends, you know, on the mood, lots of classics and, You know, Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole, Mm -hmm. Sarah Vaughan, you know, not what I grew up in, so to speak, in terms of the Motown sound and stuff like that. But Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, just depends on any day. Yeah, I tend to go more toward reading and watching television as homework or, Mm -hmm. you know, consideration of projects. I look up and another day has gone by and I don't think I've accomplished anything that I set out to do. 
<laughs> when you're working, do you prefer quiet or is it is there a little music on softly in the background or you, no, you like quiet? I'm a news junkie. There's, uh, you know, MSNBC or CNN or mm-hmm. sometimes the dreaded Fox on most of the day. Sometimes yeah. it's so bad that I have to put on a cooking show. <laughs> yeah, this this year has been tough to uh, the last year and a half. It's been tough to look away from the news. No question about that. So um, tell me weekday breakfast. What might that look like for you? I don't eat breakfast. Well, Not at all. I, I have coffee and um, I do what's called intermittent fasting. Mm-hmm. So um, and I've never been a big breakfast person. So I hate to think what I would have if I did eat breakfast, <laughs> but um, I don't usually eat until about one o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. And intermittent fasting. So when would the next meal then be? Well, the window is basically eight hours. So I huh. eat between the hours of one and nine at night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not strict, strict, strict. So sometimes if I'm hungry, I'll eat something earlier or later if I have a business meeting. Mm-hmm. Although there haven't been many of those lately, but it's it's pretty much uh, listening to my body and and seeing if I'm hungry or not. Sounds good. So, L.A. restaurant you frequent most often, and why? There's a restaurant that's sort of hidden away called Il Piccolino. Uh, Posted Bean was too far away. I'm sure. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Kirkhoff. Eddie Kirkhoff, right? And Silvio. It's small. They have a menu that. You know, it's like the size of um, the Cheesecake Factory in in terms of options. And because I've known them for such a long time, you know, it's it's like friends, you know, where everybody knows your name and it's comfortable and 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 the food is excellent. I love that room. And and Eddie is just a, a great host. I don't know Silvio as well, but I know Eddie and his wife, uh, Britt, in there are just lovely people. Absolutely. And so yeah. that, that's yeah. basically why is that. You know, it never fails. And, you know, and I, I like you probably have memories, too, of, of Eddie at La Dome. And I liked uh, I admired how he scaled it down after La Dome and then, you know, did Il Piccolino, just an intimate, great room with very cool people like yourself <laughs> oftentimes, you know, in, in there. Yeah. All right. So the best live musical performance that you've seen. Oh, goodness. That's tough because, I mean, everybody from Tina Turner to Earth, Wind & Fire to back in the day, the Jackson 5 with Michael, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. Diana Ross Mm -hmm. at times. There isn't a way to say the best, Mm -hmm. but I think there's a way to say how often have you been moved by a performer on stage? And for me, that is often where, you know, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and you go, I'm witnessing greatness. You know, this Mm. is something you could not experience on television or on recorded music. You know, you had to be there kind of thing. Do you remember the first time you felt that way seeing someone perform? I have to say way back in the day, seeing Sly and the Family Stone at the forum blew my socks off. Unbelievable energy. I mean, and I'm talking about God, almost 50 years ago, you know? mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it was electric. I thought that night he could run for president and win, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was, he had the audience in the palm of his hand. But, huh? you know, growing up in New York and Harlem, going to the Apollo and, um, you know, sort of standing online in the rain to see the Motortown review or Chuck Jackson or any of the, you know, performers who would, come through that too was you know sort of inspirational and moving i saw uh sly and the family stone at madison square garden and he got married on stage really and that was yeah that was that was quite a uh, a memorable memorable concert so complete this sentence for me i have little to no patience for dishonesty injustice where are you looking forward to traveling to you know I'm not looking forward to traveling anywhere at the moment. Uh, if I was looking forward to going anywhere, it would be to Martha's Vineyard or the Caribbean. That's it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to mm-hmm. go and get stuck in a country and I can't get out. I, I've done a lot of traveling in my life. And frankly, I am what the COVID taught me 
uh, Brad, was that I am a natural homebody and I am very comfortable in my nest. So travel for me, particularly with the pandemic, is not alluring at this point. And Mm -hmm. even though I think it might be safe, if I'm going to make a mistake, I'm going to make it by staying home. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. It's it's been that kind of a year. Um, Suzanne, who past or present would you most like to host at an intimate dinner party? I would like to invite a woman who inspired me back in the day by the name of Ruth Bowen. And most people don't know of her, but she was uh, the first woman that I ever met in the music or in the entertainment business who had her own company. She managed many of the R&B acts. She took on the quote unquote mob in terms of protecting her business. She was at one time Aretha Franklin's manager. She was very kind to me when I was just starting out at a club in New York called Cheetah. Mm -hmm. And um, she passed away before she was able to finish her autobiography. But I think that she's one person that I would like to uh, finish the conversation now that I have, you know, sort of traveled the path that she basically uh, opened back in the late sixties in New York city. I'm surprised that's not a name that's familiar to me at all. Yeah. Great guest, yeah. but I'm, I'm shocked. I've never, never heard that name before. Well, you know, they're, they're famous people too, like Octavia Butler. I'd love to sit down with her and dig in, you know, James Baldwin, of course, I did have the pleasure of meeting Tony Morrison and, uh, you know, I think storytellers for me are very, very uh, attractive. You know, they, that's what I do. And so I would love to, you know, basically engage with many people who've successfully engaged us as an audience or a reader. Are you someone who hosts dinner parties? Do you do many parties at, at your home? No, I don't. Um, and especially I'm kind of a once a year person. <laughs> and it's usually our house specialties, which is a combination of barbecue and Jamaican food. <laughs> so uh, it's usually when the weather is warm and uh, we can be outside and, and stuff like that. But, you know, Brad, so many things have changed in terms of priorities mm-hmm. and um, reckoning with the COVID virus. It, it, it's just, you know, you, I listen to you ask these questions and I go, well, maybe at one time, Yes less and less lately. I feel like, you know, we're all trying to lean into it, you know, the COVID being behind us and then, um, you know, yet it's still very present in this it's not variant. It's is right in front of us. No, certainly not. Yep. So Suzanne, let's, let's jump in here. Um, it's been a couple of years since I've seen you, obviously, as we've been alluding to, there's a lot going on. How are you? How are you doing these days? You escaped to Florida, I believe. Is that where you are? <laughs> that is that is true. It you know wasn't necessarily intended that way. We were traveling, and then COVID hit, and next thing we knew, we were here at uh, my wife's sister's home, and we ended up buying a house over in Miami that uh, that we're renovating during a pandemic, which is a whole nother adventure. I'll tell you about it another time. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm currently in Florida. Yeah. So how are you? I'm good. You know, I I feel. Excited about getting back to work. You know, I've been working the whole time, but to really get back mm-hmm. into production, and people say, oh, my God, are you still working? And I go, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I'm a Bill Withers fan. Use me till you use me up. <laughs> my man, yeah, we lost we lost Bill, you okay. know, last year. That was that was quite sad. Then you know, you've had a hand in shaping so much of American culture over the past 40 to 50 years and through the lens, primarily the black experience in music, film, television. And for women, I mean, you've, you've really defied the odds. I'd like to take a step back and hear a bit about the foundation that that led to this incredible life. You were born and raised in Harlem in New York. I believe your parents separated when you were very young. And though you lived with your mom, your dad stayed very active in your life. Can you give us a little insight into what life was like in the past household and what kind of values were instilled in you early on? Both my parents are of Jamaican descent. 
My maternal grandparents were born in Jamaica and my father was born in Jamaica. But I was basically raised uh, by my grandfather and his three daughters, of which one was my mother. <laughs> and uh, he was a physician who was uh, self-made, emigrated from Jamaica, uh, put himself through uh, college and medical school, opened a practice in Harlem, and was able to provide for our family in uh, ways that were probably a generation ahead of many of our other uh, relatives and family members. So uh, my mother and her sisters, my mother was the eldest, Babs. The middle was Constance, Connie, and the baby was Jackie, Jacqueline. And um, Jackie is the sole surviving sister at this time. But I think that um, I was privileged to uh, grow up in a way that was unique. I was living in Harlem. I went to the same private school for 12 years. And every summer from the time I was 16 days old, I spent at least three months in Martha's Vineyard growing up. So this very eclectic uh, sort of chameleon existence, you know, you could sort of, and to this day, I think you can drop me anywhere and I will adapt. So, mm -hmm. and I think it has to do with not only the values that, my family instilled in me, especially my mother. Um, but the experiences that we had when my mother was divorcing my father, my grandfather sent us to uh, Europe first class on a ship called the Coronia. I was three years old and I actually, uh, we were gone for a number of months and I actually began to speak French before I spoke English. Is there a remnant? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, you know, those kinds of uh, life experiences that, you know, I was as comfortable on Sutton Place as I was sitting in the Apollo or going to the record shack on 125th Street. And, you know, there was there's nothing like growing up in New York culturally. Mm -hmm. And my mother saw to it that whether it was the ballet or the opera or Broadway or museums, that was part of my and, and also at school. We had a lot of that, a very small private school called New Lincoln. So a long answer to a short question, Brad, but I really feel like the windows of the world were open to me without any hesitation or reservation. Um, I was in Jack and Jill, you know, and um, it wasn't about um, feeling uh, special. It was about feeling normal because this was my normal. And um, I look back on it now and I realize how very special it was. Mm -hmm. Well, Suzanne, I'm curious, you know, going, growing up in Harlem, obviously going to, um, you know, New, New Lincoln School was a pretty prestigious school with some notable members. I, I see Sherry Belafonte went to school there, Thelma Golden, who was the curator and director of the Studio Museum in Harlem, both Stanley and his, the documentary filmmaker Stanley Nelson and his sister Jill. Um, so some really some some prominent African-American names. But you mentioned, you know, Ma Martha's Vineyard, obviously, you know, growing up in Harlem, going to private school. I mean, that's that's a very um, that is a unique um, combination of places to have in your um, as part of your experience. And, you know, like you, I, I grew up going to Martha's Vineyard and, um, you know, kind of a similar situation. But I'm just curious what. What was your what was your takeaway from Harlem from that time? What do you remember? What stands out for you about the the heart, the community of Harlem from from that? Well, you know, my mother uh, was a elementary school teacher in Harlem. And so the school was across the street from where we where I grew up, the Riverton apartment complex on 135th mm -hmm. Street. I just remember that when uh, another complex went up called Lenox Terrace, there was this sort of 135th Street was, was popping, you know, mm -hmm. and I um, went to work at Harlem Hospital while I was still in high school, um, three nights a week. And that was an experience in and of itself. It was the outpatient psychiatric clinic, which wow. <laughs> was something I remember looking out my window uh, and I could see the playground in our complex where there was this really talented basketball player called Lou Alcindor <laughs> <laughs> playing. <laughs> that name sounds familiar. Right. And, um, you know, it was just 
so interesting to uh, be rubbing shoulders with people who went on to be legendary themselves. You know, they, the politicians, the medical, you know, because my grandfather was practicing in uh, Harlem at the time. And, you know, it was it, the community was very closely knit, you know, in terms of people knew everybody, you know, in my little area. And then there were people that would come down from 145th Street or from Washington Heights. And, you know, we would go to track meets at the armory. And, you know, there, there was just this life that was mm-hmm. my Harlem life, which I felt completely comfortable in. And then my private school life, which sometimes blended the two. And, you know, our school was a real melting pot of, um, you read some of the names, but, you know, uh, Zero Mostel's son, Josh, was in my class. It just felt like, and I look back on it and I say, you know, it was really an amazing bubble that I lived in. Not to say that I didn't uh, have my share of concerns and moments of how can I help fix this as it related to, um, you know, the inequities. I went to uh, work for, uh, there was a thing called Har You Act, Harlem Youth for Self-Help. And I drove a, uh, I was the only one that could drive a stick shift. So I drove the van and we would go to various blocks and unload our stuff and, and work with kids and have little reading and art classes for them and stuff like that. So, you know, I think that I was the beneficiary of belonging to and feeling comfortable in, in many communities and um, never felt that I couldn't participate in a meaningful way. And then there were times when I just wanted to sit back, listen to music, go to the Apollo or go to a party. (laughs) And hang. Yeah. Yeah. 135th Street was was pretty significant. Um, I used to play basketball in that park right across from um, 22 West. And uh, that was a restaurant I would eat often at with my dad. And my first my very first crush, Lynn Smith, grew up in uh, the Riverton (laughs) Uh, apartments. So I, I know that neighborhood very well. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, and then if you go all the way up to um, what we call 7th Avenue at that time, there was Small's Paradise. I have to say that the nightlife in Harlem was incredible and glamorous and dangerous, perhaps, but nobody was. When I think about danger to what danger is today, that danger looked like you know, child's play. You know, right. somebody might pull a knife on somebody, but that was it. There was no shoot 'em ups or uh, big mass disasters. And um, we used to go to some of the, the other clubs where we would go for chicken and waffles after the clubs closed. I mean, it was the legendary Wells, or well, we would go to Wells, but there was another place. I'm trying to think. It was it Basie's, and then there was the original Red Rooster. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't so much after hours as it was during hours, you know. But yeah, the we would go downtown and and pretend we were eighteen and go to the Village Vanguard and you know listen to all of the great jazz artists and stuff like that. I mean, Manhattan was a festival of stuff to do, and I think it was really fortunate that I went to work at Motown because there was, as I was living there before I went to Motown, you know, I dropped out of Syracuse, even though they claim me as an alumna. Um, <laughs> but if I had stayed there, I think I probably never have had a great career because there would be too many social things to do you know, for 24 hours a day. I want to go back to that for a moment because you were booking musical acts at the cheetah, and uh, I guess you uh, you were expressing your opinion to the owners or the manager because you like to go there and dance, and then you would let them know which bands you thought were were talented and and let your your feelings be known. But I I heard you tell a very funny story about wanting to take um, your girlfriend Cindy Birdsong out for dinner when she became a member of the uh, of the Supremes, and I guess she had called and, and sought your advice and you told her absolutely you should go for it. And there's a funny story about how you first met uh, Barry Gordy. Would, do you mind just, just retelling that so know, we hear it from you? Uh, Cindy was a member of Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells. And 
a friend, uh, we had a mutual friend, Jimmy Castor, who said, you know, you guys should meet. And uh, he was a musician, very famous for, hey, Leroy, your mom is calling you. <laughs> and you got potential. And but, Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> P-O-T-E-N-T-I-L. <laughs> potential. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had, um, one, I was uh, on weekends, on Sundays, traditionally the, the Cheetah was closed. And two local DJs, Rocky G and Frankie Crocker, decided to rent the club for Sunday afternoons. And they would get the gate, you know, the people would pay, would pay to come in. And look, Cheetah held like 1,500 people. And the record companies would give the acts for free in exchange for airplay, which, of course, I look back on now and realize it was payola. <laughs> That's payola. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that then? So, right. um Jimmy had said, you know, when, when the bluebells come, when Patty the Bell and the bluebells come, go back and, and say hi to Cindy, which I did. And we became friends. And when she called me to say that, um, Motown had approached her to replace Florence Ballard in the Supremes and she didn't know what she should do. <laughs> I was her big, you know, her friend in show business. So, and I was like, are you out of your mind? Of course you will. <laughs> and so she did. So when, Cheetah was located diagonally across from what was then the 52nd Street Theater, which is now the Ed Sullivan Theater, where every week Ed Sullivan would do his show. And, you know, I never paid much attention to it until Cindy was coming to town on her first Ed Sullivan appearance. And I wanted to take her out to celebrate. And she said yes. And I said, OK. And, and, and I, it occurred to me that the reliability of getting a, a cab in New York, if you were black in those days, was kind of hit and miss. And you'd put your hand out and they'd pull up on you. And of course, uh, in those days, I didn't have this Scandinavian blonde hair. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, and you're standing on the uptown side I'd of the street. The so, yeah. The street, and even though I lived on uh, East 57th Street, there were times I didn't want to go to Harlem. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, they would slam the meter down and rumble and all kinds of things. <laughs> so I decided that the solution to this potential problem was to rent a limousine that I could not afford. But I did it anyway. And uh, so I'm sitting outside the stage door of the Ed Sullivan Theater, 52nd Street Theater. And Cindy, event I wanted to go inside. I was desperate to go inside. But those Jamaican people that raised me, you know, would never have, they were on my shoulder. You know, I could hear them. <laughs> You're not invited. You know, just slow your roll. So she came out and said the words that literally changed my life forever. She leaned in the car window and she said, Suzanne, Mr. Gordy's car has gone on an errand. He has an appointment. Can we give him a ride? And I said, sure. <laughs> I wasn't a fool. <laughs> and um, I just happened to have a limo <laughs> on standby. He, he gets in the car in the limo and practically dislocates his neck looking at this, you know, sort of 19 year old girl <laughs> who's giving him a ride. And I think he was kind of fascinated because mm -hmm. I've always thought he thought I was probably a hooker, not an heiress. <laughs> You know, but nonetheless, we call that the ride that's lasted over 50 years because mm -hmm. we took him to uh, his appointment, which was to see some artwork. He had us come in to the gallery. And then he said, well, look, why don't you, instead of you guys going out to dinner, come to the Essex house where they were all staying and have dinner there. And so off we go. And I didn't have the presence of mind to dismiss the, uh, the limo. It's waiting outside for me. And I only live like five blocks away. And so, but I had really never seen anything like that dinner where all of his aides and people were leaping and twirling and bringing him telephones and fax, you know, faxes and documents and stuff like that. And I was just amazed, really. And, and that was the beginning. That's how um, I met Mr. Gordy. And um, as I call him, he became my mentor and my tour mentor. <laughs> so, um, but that was yeah, that's a great story. Um, I, I read in uh, I think it was Vanity Fair um, and I wanted to read from uh, a quote that I pulled out um, from you. And you said, quote, I was booking bands at the Cheetah Nightclub in New York. And when I told Mr. Gordy that I could never get anyone at Motown to call me back, 
He said, maybe they needed to hire me. They flew me to Detroit first class on a 7 a.m. flight. I was wearing my little Bonwit Teller suit, had an overnight bag, was picked up at the airport by Barry Gordy's driver in a maroon Fleetwood Cadillac. They then drove me to Hitsville and I was horrified. My expectation was that it would be a more opulent, grand building. Um, you know, the, 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 image of you, Suzanne, in this Bonwit Teller suit. Um, you know, just the there's there's a lot there that I that I just gleaned from this and and the fact that you had a limousine on this big night for Cindy. You were a planner, you had attention to detail, you expressed your opinions, you had an eye for talent. Would you say that those attributes kind of describe who you were then and and maybe even who you are now? Uh yes. <laughs> in a yeah. word, yes. You know, when you are blessed to have people who believe in you, as my family did, especially my mother. When I dropped out of college, I mean, that was like a an atomic bomb going off in a Jamaican family, especially. I mean, that was just not done. And yet she stuck by me all through those, you know, before you get accolades and before you get recognized and before you even accomplish anything, you have to not only believe in yourself, but the reason that you can believe in yourself is that other people believe in you too. And that to me is why I had placed a great deal of value in my own opinions and thoughts is that I thought I was valued by my family. And um, I think that is the launching pad like no other. So yes, I wasn't always right, and I certainly have made my share of whopper mistakes, but that initial sort of uh, cultivation of your self-worth, and in my case, my self-worth, was, as I look back on it, everything. Yeah, I mean, you know, you the the self assuredness. Um, you know, you you've always just struck me as someone who, you know would have an opinion and not not so much that you would be married to your own ideas, but that, you know, you would certainly have an opinion and there was and it was certainly one worth worth listening to. And, you know, clearly, Suzanne, you know, you were sharp and and had, you know, some attributes that were not common. But can you talk a little bit about how you developed as a creative executive being immersed in the in, in the environment around Motown and someone like Barry Gordy? Well, how, how did you develop as a creative executive given given that environment? Well, you know, first, I think you have to be interested in the work. I mean, and, and not just interested, like, turn it on, turn it off, but immersed in it. You know, immersed. Mm -hmm. it's an immersive uh, sort of, uh, I think, application of your attention and, you know, your awareness. But I developed the notion that we all have an, an antenna, so to speak, and your antenna is either up or not. And if your antenna is up, you are receiving all kinds of things. And your ability to discern what's coming in, I think, is, is a mark of your taste, your taste and ultimately what some people would call a talent for uh, recognizing the talent of others. And I think that I do have that talent of uh, it's not fail safe. You know, it doesn't ever it doesn't mean 100 percent, but it does mean the ability to recognize the value and the talent of other people, whether it's in music or storytelling or just whatever it is as, as, a, as an executive. And that, I think, is a function of just being interested enough to want to know more and to want to recognize good ideas where they are and good people where they are. I don't know where it actually comes from, but it... It's something that I rely on and and have always is that, you know, the little hairs on the back of my neck and the feeling in my gut, and, you know, it's it's and then it it requires a certain amount of courage because I don't think that you can put yourself out there if you're not willing to fail and you're not willing to be mm. and mm -hmm. be, be voted down and stuff like that. And so the key to me is to be thoughtful, but to be bold. And have the courage of your convictions, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it really does matter, I think, um, to take a chance. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, I hear people talk about Clive Davis is, you know, having an an ear. He has, you know, the, the golden ear. And and you strike me as someone who has both an ear and an eye. Are those two separate things or does one kind of lead to the other? Uh, that's a really good question, Brad. I don't know. Um, I think that mm-hmm. one can trigger the other. You know, the old joke, first you've got to get its attention. The old, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what is it that reaches you first? You know, I think that people who are consistently able, as Barry Gordy obviously demonstrated. And the thing that I've always found interesting about the the, the uh, sort of comparison of Barry Gordy and Clive, because they, they do make that comparison a lot, is that in the case of Barry Gordy, he was spending his own money. And in the case of Clive Davis, he was spending corporate public money, in effect. And I think that is worth noting because growing up in an environment where someone like Barry Gordy as your mentor makes decisions that I could spend this dollar or I could put it in my pocket. And in spending this dollar, I'm taking a chance on this person or this group or this project. And I grew up in that environment. And that's the one Mm -hmm. that I think uh, has always been a challenge for the entrepreneur, particularly as a black woman, is that, you know, there aren't a lot of ways for you to be able to spend whatever money you have because you don't have enough of it to make a difference. (laughs) So you're at the effect of others who have the money. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, once Barry Gordy sold Motown and uh, I eventually started to pass entertainment, which is now to pass Jones, entertainment um you know it's it's a little bit like having to reinvent the wheel every time yeah you know suzanne i wanted to i wanted to turn to um lady sings the blues you were nominated uh for co-writing that screenplay for an academy award i rewatched it over the weekend is you know it's it's a beautiful film it's really stunning uh and also seeing richard Pryor was you know just reminded how much of a treat um he always was but I, I wanted to get your long view on how black culture has been covered in the media. And obviously, we don't have you know a tremendous amount of time here. And I know that's a, probably a lengthy subject. But I happened to read um, Vincent Canby's review, the New York Times film critic at the time of Lady Sings the Blues. And he was not kind, um, yet nominated for an Academy Award for the screenplay. So I would say that trumps the New York Times review. But... When when thinking about how black culture has been um, portrayed through the lens of of the media, we'll say, do you do you have any feelings about that over the course of your career? Is it has it shaped any of the decisions or, or opportunities that that uh, came your way or did not come your way? Just the um, the way that uh, our story gets told told in the media. Well, it's not just the media. It's you know in in Hollywood. The uh, further trumping the New York Times just as a point of order, <laughs> we, had, we were nominated for five Academy Awards, of which Diana Ross was also nominated. But, you know, the thing that I find the most egregious in the celebration of our artists and culture is that they're only, let's put it this way, there's a narrow corridor of storytelling that makes the powers that be in Hollywood comfortable. Slavery, sports, gangsters, drugs. You know, the, the, the categories are, you know, comedy, buffoonery. But I was so happy to see the movie Sylvie's Love um, this past year because it's not about being black, you know. And mm-hmm. I think it's important culturally for us to celebrate all aspects of our existence in the culture. And it's not always about being where other people are comfortable making those movies, you know, musicals or music driven projects, but, but the, just the color matching that has happened recently where you have to look like your project in order to make it happen. You know, I don't subscribe to that because I think it's, it's further segregating our talented artists to only be in a certain 
category of projects. Why can't we do science fiction? Why can't we do general market romance? Why can't we, why can't we just show up and be talented? So for me, it's not just what the media does. It's what the people who are able to finance and green light projects and that they, they tend to say, of course, they're exceptions. And what I think Lady Sings the Blues was at a time when there was no such thing as, and, and drugs were a part of that film, but it was also very glamorous and very romantic. And so I think that um, more of the barriers to just storytelling need to, need to fall because if I had bought into that, I never would have done Lonesome Dove. You know, and in today's world, I'm not sure they would let me because I don't look like the project. Right. I guess, you know, I'd, I'd frame it in the question uh, or the question, um, I guess, leading with the, the media, because I, I think of the media as the, um, you know, the arbiter of what's relevant. And yes, I, I, I certainly agree that the, the folks who green light will, will, you know, a project can happen and then the media might report about it or, or write about it and talk about it. But, you know, I, I also believe that the exposure that the media provides for, you know, certainly in my case, having come out of the restaurant industry, if you don't get that exposure, you don't get the opportunities. So you need the media first before, you know, the opportunities come. And if the media does not come, those opportunities don't find you either. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned Sylvie's Love. I tried to get that movie made about 20 years ago uh, and uh, and there were no takers. But I, I wanted to ask you, too, about because it brings up a question for me. I mean, you you know, you've, you've been around for a long time. You've got a long body of work. You know, some would think that, you know, if Suzanne DePass calls whomever a project gets done, I know better. I know it's not that easy. But I'm also curious, Suzanne, what's your take on does does Hollywood have a black male executive issue? Because I cannot think of a well, certainly there's no black studio head. And, you know, we've got Tyler Perry and, and Oprah's got her own thing. Black talent agency, uh, CAA, William Morris Endeavor. Um, you know, I can't think of a, a black partner in at any of those places. Um, and I think that of the of the trailblazers like yourself, like Debbie Allen, who, you know, is, um, has so many, has created so many opportunities and jobs for others as a producer, as a choreographer, you as a producer, you as a writer. I can't think of a black male equivalent to either one of you two. Is, am I missing someone or? Well, you know, the interesting thing is in the, uh, sort of, uh, institutional Hollywood, I think you're right. You know, there may be a business affairs person here or there, but in the green light hierarchy, even to be on the green light committee, I don't know of one. I mean, Charles King has his company and, mm -hmm. it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, it's like a needle in the haystack. And, <laughs> you know, to your point about media, I think traditional media versus social media is something to be discussed also because social media has almost replaced the emphasis on traditional media. And so if you can, you know, generate enough social media, you don't need traditional media necessarily. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's nice to have mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. but it's, yeah. it's sort of um, changed. But uh, getting back to the male executive, I think that there is a um, comfort level that white men have with black women, frankly that makes it possible for people like Channing Dungy and, you know, different ones to get big positions, particularly ever since, you know, everybody was shining a light on the diversity. I mean, tragedy in Hollywood. Um, but I don't know that there can be, unless someone rides into town with saddlebags filled with money mm. to, uh, and and certainly in the traditional, you know, four or five studios that are left, if there is one, he's hiding. Do you think I mean, with the with the with streaming now, it seems uh, the, the barrier between where where there was a segregation, it seemed for, you know, 
historically between you did TV or you did movies, you, you know, kind of went between both worlds, you know, historically. But with, with streaming now, is the line completely blurred between the two? And do you think movie theaters, when you're when you're envisioning a project, Suzanne, are you thinking of this is a project I want people to see in a movie theater or are we going to or movie theater is going to be obsolete with with the uh, streaming and everybody watching movies in the comfort of their own home? I do not know of any project that I would ever do going forward that I would consider for anything but a streaming or, you know, television experience. Because I'm not known for blockbusters and, you know, the things that are going to make teenagers maybe leave home and go have a, a date night. But if I never go to another movie theater that's filled with people breathing all over me, it will be too soon. I am past that. I think that the movie going experience is not dead, but is, you know, close to dying mm -hmm. for a large number of people. Now, there's still going to be people that love that and, and the popcorn and the whatever. But I personally am very happy to make entertainment for people that want to see it in their newly renovated home theaters. I do think the line is blurred. This will be a, a terrible analogy, but, you know, you mentioned Martha's Vineyard and, um, you know, we know the movie Jaws was filmed right. on Martha's Vineyard. Right. And, you know, since that movie, and I'm an ocean lover, and there has not been a time that I have gotten in the ocean and not thought about getting bitten by a shark. And I think from this moment forward, the idea of a crowded restaurant, sharing plates of food, a crowded theater. I don't know that we'll ever think of those things in quite the same way. I agree with you. And I am right with you on the jaws of it all. If I go in the ocean, I better be able to see for five miles around me. <laughs> because I, I never felt safe again after jaws. And then every time you turn on the news, someone else has gotten bitten on Cape Cod. So I'm done right. with that. And they're, and they're tracking the great whites now. So they actually let you know where they are, which but is yeah, there's some I, comfort I the in that, I guess. About, about, you know, how people have become their own networks. They mm -hmm. watch what they want when they want to watch it. They record what they want and they have myriad choices of what to do. So the notion of hiring a sitter, getting the transportation, buying the tickets, buying the popcorn, leave home, that is a monumental commitment when you could be home with your feet up making your own popcorn and being just as entertained. So I, other than wanting to be in a dark place with your honey, you know, that you're for prospective honey, because there aren't that many things for people to do other than go to a movie when you first start dating or whatever, you know, so I get that. But other than that, I don't see it. I don't see it. <laughs> All right. So before I let you go, I want to talk about some of the projects that you're working on and, and you got some really cool stuff coming up. Let's let's first start with the Marvin Gaye story. I know that's been something that's been talked about for a long, long time. And is that finally going to see the light of day? It is. And, you know, I'm pleased to say that the while uh, Madison and I are definitely involved and working on it, the lead part of the team, which is Dr. Dre and Alan Hughes and Andrew Lazar are, and um, Jimmy Ibeam, they are mm -hmm. going to make it happen. I've worked on a, trying to do a Marvin Gaye project for a hundred years and more power to them to be able to get it done because it was tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I know that. And it's such a phenomenal story and definitely look forward to that. Any, um, would you be revealing anything if you told us who you would really like to see play Marvin? You know, I don't think I've seen that person yet. I don't mm -hmm. think that I've seen, because to me, famous people playing famous people can almost be to the detriment of the project. So I feel like there's someone out there, whether he's, semi-famous or unknown, who, given an audition, will, you know, sort of do what needs to be done in order to cast a Marvin Gaye character. Because I just feel like you don't want to go, oh, look, there's Will Smith playing. Right. You know, <laughs> it, 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 it takes you out of the story. So for me, the casting process, you know, you read a script, you've done notes, you've done drafts, you read it again. And you hear the dialogue in your head in a certain way that someone comes in the room and completely blows you away 
with their interpretation of the words that are completely different than the way you heard them in your head. And those are the moments that I think are, you know, difference in just settling for someone and, and doing the mm -hmm. deep dive search for someone. We spent three months at least casting the Temptations miniseries. And I am here to tell you that not all black men can sing and dance. Much less. <laughs> I mean, it was like, whoa. We'll put that rumor to right. rest here and now, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Miriam Makiba, what a fascinating life, the South African singer songwriter. I had no idea, Suzanne, that uh, she was married to Stokely Carmichael and you, Masakila. What that? about that story? <laughs> How about that? I know. <laughs> Just, she is a fascinating, beautiful, unique, uh, ravaged, uh, just. I, I just am so honored to be part of this team to bring her story to the audience because um, people need to know about her and they don't. And my barometer for any true, true story is first, it's got to be a great story. And then, oh, by the way, it's based in fact and truth. Mm -hmm. So, and hers is, hers is unbelievable. And so we're waiting with bated breath to get our script and, um, Zinga Stewart is writing it and going to direct. It's just so hard because people are busy and, you know, other projects get in the way and stuff like that. But, you know, that's one of those where you just stay with it until it gets done. Yeah, what a phenomenal story. And uh, so also, too, there is an autobiography in the works and potentially a, a series about your days at, uh, at Motown. Yeah. So what can you share about that? Well, you know, I wish I was more interested in my own story than... <laughs> <laughs> other people's well, the rest of us are, I can assure you. But yeah, the um, the autobiography is going slowly. There are some conversations now. Um, project had been set up and it just wasn't the right situation. So, you know, I'm going to be as careful with my story as I am with anybody else's, especially mine, um, to make sure it gets mm -hmm. in the right uh, environment to, I think it could be, instructive. I think it could be entertaining. And I think that it is definitely unique. As I look back on it, I feel like, God, Suzanne, you're lucky to be alive. <laughs> we take those chances when we're younger. You know, I used to have the Honda 250 motorcycle that my roommate's brother gave to us and um, beating around at four o'clock in the morning in Manhattan after closing down the Salvation Disco on my way to breakfast at the Brasserie. No helmet, no glove, just mini skirted blue. wild child wild child wow wild. <laughs> but uh, fearless and now you know i won't even go to a movie theater <laughs> <laughs> but that's i think what you get a certain amount of wisdom with, with age yes hopefully so well suzanne it's, it's really been a pleasure i want to thank you for all of the meaningful inspirational and enjoyable content that you've had a hand in over the years. I'm a, a big fan of your work and you personally, and it's really been an honor uh, to have you on the show. And, and thanks so much uh, for joining me. It's been my pleasure, Brad, and I'm very happy to see you. And um, don't forget about LA. No, I won't. I'll be out soon. I hope to see you when I'm okay, there. I hope so. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you. So the lovely Ambassador Shabazz is here to join me for How We Move. Ambassador, what's going on? Well, boy, that was really wonderful to sort of sit back and, and listen to and also journey back a couple of um, generations myself, a couple of decades, well, more than that, um, to the contributions of Suzanne to pass, but even more significantly just to kind of uh, capture the root of who she was from the beginning, what started her off in the world, where she, what her influences were. I think most of us that know her at all associate her to Motown as a beginning. And, you know, that's always one's young adult life. But who really fed you and inspired you from the beginning? And I loved hearing about her New York commencement to her parents is binationals and Jamaican Americans and the insistences that her parents surrounded her with is what we are ultimately the beneficiaries of. So it's not just the Detroit birth or association to her journey, meaning the Motown story, Motown benefits from who her parents mm -hmm initiated, right? And the exposure and the lack of limitation or restriction to her 
um, grasping all things. And I loved hearing her reference that quite a bit. And so for me, it was good because I've known of Suzanne to pass and then have gotten to know her as a friend over the decades. But in all that time, I guess I entered her life when it was already Motown associated and never in our time together did I know that I could have a New York chat, you know, and as I listen to this and I could echo, I mean, I do know who Ruth Bowen is and of course Baldwin and the <laughs> Riverton, Lennox Terrace. I mean, those are defining people, circumstances, landmarks, stories for Black America, for Harlem, for culture. We are largely a beneficiary of people now, of the classics that were um, generated during those places in that era. And if only we could um, fine tune and identify, but that as people talk about the new Harlem, but they don't realize the meat, the soul, the, 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 the investment in early Harlem, you know, um, in the twenties or thirties, who was there? Garvey was there, had 21 businesses, you know, Arturo Schomburg. And so her parents would be of that circulation. And of course, the children be, would be beneficiaries of that. And we as a cultural market are thus also beneficiaries of how Suzanne DePass and others, you know, Caribbean Americans who were first and second generation who were really triumphant during that period to give us what we have now in various forms. And so it was superb to get to know her differently. You know, you can think you know someone by a biographical narrative and then you learn more about yeah, who they she, are. She was Suzanne DePass before she got to Motown. Yeah, that's, clearly. <laughs> she was yeah. all of Suzanne DePass before she got to Motown. And it makes you want to know who are her parents. You know, I mean, so that's always it. And we have stopped that. We usually start with people's Wikipedia brief, you know, and you say, well, who made you? What gave you you? I mean, that's right. why I also love your your the way you introduce the programs, because it just sort of takes us off the map, off the grid. Um, none of us are defined by that paragraph. I often ask people. You know, if you were to write your own paragraph, what would it say? Because I know when I move around, there's a paragraph that precedes me that just doesn't fit. Right. You know, so you have to wiggle around a little bit politely. Well, so because it starts at chapter 12. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and written by someone who didn't know anything about 11 and before. Right. right. One through. Right, right. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that was really a treasure. And at this point in her season space, in the quiet place that she gets to have and reflect reflectively and still to have such impact and affirmation and sanctioning and she can green light and alliance and a partnership and bequeath to others. We need to learn more and more about those influencers. So influencers are not 20 and under or 30 and under. Influencers are those who are fortunately still amongst us um, who we can reach and engage and affirm being there's a part of her, even at her age now, that could reference what it is to be 19, as she did in your program. You know, that's the age of today's influencers. You know, the intrigue that made Barry Gordy say, tell me more, you know. Um, so I was just excited to to hear about her. And then when she started naming different people, you, and, you know, you started singing Poe. You know, I know that'll, that'll only fall on people a certain age as well. Yeah. You, know? you know, when when she um, it struck me when she when I read what she had talked about, um, you know, her her decision to put on her bond with Teller yeah. dress when she went to meet uh, Barry Gordy out in Detroit, and you know, just the 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 self awareness of presentation. Right. Um, you know, all of that to be so self-assured going right. into an opportunity that became the opportunity of a lifetime. But that person was was formed when they Absolutely. went there. Absolutely. I think you and I have both talked about that, the preservation, the presentation, how we represent ourselves based on those who um, are whispering in our ear on one shoulder or the other, our parents and the examples before us. And I think it's really key because we are very often our own agents um, long before representation and sanctioning. And so how do we walk into a room um, knowing that we are the one for the position or the job 
and that someone else is wavering is really not indicative of our value. It's just they're not knowing to quite what to do with us. Um, and so we can't get that confused in how she talked about her confidence. I mean, she walked around the world knowing that she was key. It, it does not mean it makes the road easier, but knowing yourself and that being affirmed and your root and your background and your affirmations is really just key. So how do we help with that and with that, with going forward with the people in our lives and our loved ones, not to be distracted by, as you all talked about, traditional media or social media? you know, the status quo or the new quo, you know, um, and that it really does change as soon as we decide that it should be changed. Our lives in the last 24 months is different than it was prior and everyone is adapting. So um, it's one thing to have tradition and rhythms of such, but if it's not beneficial to everyone, um, how do we go further? And so as she addresses, does the movie on Marvin Gaye, I've been around, We, you and I both know that that effort has been tried a number of times. And I love when she said, it's not just some star that we know, it's better to find the one who fits it best because this younger generation doesn't know the essence. There's something more than a singer to Marvin Gaye. There was certainly a presence to Marvin Gaye and in his silent um, kind of carriage, you could feel the bounty, you could feel it crackle and pop. You knew there was so much that's going on and um, I mean, just to go back periodically, I will replay his um, anthem when he did the <laughs> – he did it twice. But one the time NBA All-Star it. game? Yes. I mean, yeah. he did it in in like quor- halftime, right? He, and I don't mean halftime show. I meant halftime. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. Did, whoever was playing he took it, it down at his pace. Did. Yes, yeah. he did. And he grooved through it. And yeah. you had to savor it, the word and the feeling yeah. and the spirit from his place. Yeah. And that's the only way he could have sang it. You know, mm-hmm. so you have that beauty. And then when, oh, my God, Mary McCabe was, I'm blessed because she was one of my aunts growing up. And when people nowadays only know about today's South Africa, they don't realize what was happening when people were being exiled from their respective countries around the globe. Um, and how we in the United States had the benefit, especially in New York, to have a Miriam Makeba amongst us and a, um, a Stokely Carmichael and a Hugh Masakela who spent time at your dad's restaurant. And I had the pleasure of bringing him to one of your restaurants in Los Angeles and the emotions filled Despite notoriety, despite fame, despite all of those other achievements, walking into your restaurant and taking it back to his heart and spirit, the early 70s and the impact of having a place to to belong is really quite a potent story. And the fact that a story on Miriam McCabe now she was also the co-executor to Nina Simone's will. And so, of course, she outlived Nina Simone a number of years. And we talked about how to pull those components back and preserve the wishes. So we're talking, people were very busy in those days. They may have been noted for their recorded acknowledgements and everything, but then there was life at home, life for real. And when she was able to, when Mandela came out and that, when South Africa was free from Miriam McCabe to be able to go back home, even though we had had her all this time and this had become home, there was no home like home. And so she was able to go back onto the soil of her birth country. And while we missed her here, we understood it, you know. And um, so, you know, when this airs, um, no matter when it's it, it's repeated in, in our annals of mm-hmm. forever after, but when it airs the first time, it'll be, you know, mid-September or so. And, and um, it will be just a few days before your mom's birthday, before... Um, the 40th anniversary of Belize's independence. There are 25 other countries that celebrate their independence in September, but also what's significant is the 40th anniversary of the International Day of Peace. And so my question really becomes to people, what does peace really mean? I mean, we talk about it, we reference it, we give the peace sign, um, it's stated or concluded jokingly, you know, um, at the end of a pageant. I just want world peace. But what does peace look like? How is it defined? Is it a pause? Is it is it ease? Is it do people have to see things your way or you theirs in order for to or do we reconcile that everyone has their own? What are the risks of peace? You know, um, we think peace is the end all, but 
Sometimes it's disruptive of governments. Some governments don't want peace. Some families don't want peace. Some neighborhoods don't want peace. What does that look like? You know, um, and I know peace of mind matters for me. And with all that's going on in the news with Kabul and Haiti, Haiti, who's been more independent longer than the United States, as we talk about our Juneteenth, they're ahead of us. And yet there's always a turmoil. And do we reach out? Do we reach out to Haiti beyond headline? Do we do we know a Haitian? Are we asking how we can be more of assistance to this country that, you know, 500 years ago um, had its revolt of independence, you know, and its signature based on its preservational pride? Um, so that's, you know, it's on the calendar every year, September 21st, International Day of Peace, now 40 years. But how do we live it? Will it come and go? Do we give thought to it? So when we talk about how we move, now it's not just about, you know, where in the world, but how amidst our own respective lives, do we pay homage to peace? Are we assisting it? Um, Does it matter to you is the question. I mean, we're, we're presuming everybody wants peace, but how do you choose your life? I know I like peace of mind. I don't need you just one to see it like I do, but peace of mind is work. You know, it's like deleting and balancing the things that really do matter, giving respect to the things that don't and letting them go so that you can be your best in that journey. And then in areas that are not as fortunate as we are, what role do we play? Well, peace is certainly aspirational and um, it's an ongoing endeavor for us to uh, to try to get there. And I think, you know, the fact that we talked about Marvin Gaye and, and you know, that yeah. what's going on album resonates oh, just wow. as much today as it did wow. the 40 years ago when it, when it was made, you know, so, you know, it's a continuum and, and uh, you know, how we move is is determined by what our objectives are. And, and here we are and just trying to chop it up and sort it out and, you know, put one foot in front of the other and hold the door open for your neighbor and say, thank you when someone holds it open for you. (laughs) Ambassador Shabazz. I'm trying. How we move. (laughs) (laughs) I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for your words today. Much appreciated. Yeah. Yeah. Back to you. Corner Table Talk is hosted by Brad Johnson, produced by Brad and Linda Ailes Johnson. Associate producer, Ariel Mancibo. Theme music, Life Goes On by Bryce Vine. Executive producer, Ken Johnson. Find the Corner Table Talk podcast where you get your podcast. Follow, subscribe, rate, and leave a comment. Corner Table Talk is a mean old lion media production.